Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're now going to have a quick change of tack. Uh, we've spent the morning talking about the S100 uh, hydrographic charting and, and what was described by Admiral Lambert as the bedrock of the maritime industry. Uh, he also mentioned that, that he, you know, the, the, the hydrographic organisations don't have a really good understanding of what's happening out in the, in the deep sea regions. Well, what I'm going to talk about are some changes in, in the industry, some improvements with satellite AIS that do give us that, that global view of maritime traffic. So we're actually starting now to understand what is really happening in the deep oceans. So why, why is this important? Well, if you look at the world itself, 84% um, is actually what they call unwired. In other words, you need space-based assets or satellites to communicate or to, uh, to surveil the, these regions. 70% uh, of those are the oceans. So in essence, the oceans are black holes you know, where people can, can actually you know, hide and disappear. As we can see from this, this Department of Homeland Security slide, uh, illegal immigration, drug smuggling, you know, most of these, the, these illegal activities do happen at sea. Uh, so understanding what is happening is becoming crucial uh, from a, a security perspective. Um, and when we talk about security, it's, it's not just the, the, the accepted use of the word security, there's also economic security. Um, these three areas are, are, are really, I think, what drives home the importance of, 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 of this understanding of, of the deep oceans. Uh, back in, I think, September 20, or 2007, uh, after a major political summit, the APEX summit, where the, the major leaders of the, of the ASEAN region and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, etc., they were in a summit in Sydney. They found out later on there was 1,500 tonnes of explosive grade ammonium nitrate on ships right next door to the convention centre. So uh, obviously nothing happened, but, but there was a potential there for, for a real issue. And from the, from the security perspective, you know, wouldn't it have been good to know, well, A, to know those vessels were there, and B, you know, to know where they'd been. Uh, that does make a difference from the security perspective. So that, that's one aspect. But economic security is probably equally as important. Uh, there's 50,000 merchant vessels out there. They transport 90% uh, of the world's goods. In other words, our, our whole global trading situation relies on the maritime industry. It's a trillion dollar industry. That sort of puts it in perspective. Uh, and if we go regional, uh, the Straits of Malacca by Singapore, 80% uh, of the oil bound for China and Japan goes to the Straits of Malacca and a quarter of the world's trade comes back through it. Uh, if there was a problem there, if the sea lanes were shut, obviously you know, that would have a major global impact that may, well look, you know, may, may make the financial crisis look like a, a very small uh, uh, issue. So we, we have to make sure that, that the sea lanes are kept open, that, that security and safety at sea are, are paramount. Uh, and then there's the environment. 4% uh, of, of global man-made CO2 comes from vessels. So being able to monitor those, to manage them, uh, and to reduce that pollution is, is obviously key. Uh, and then things like you know, cruise ships, we've, we've all read the newspapers, we've seen what's happening uh, in that sort of particular industry. Uh, the ice is melting, there's new Arctic routes starting, more ships will go through you know, very, very... Uh, tricky areas to, to navigate, so we have to keep an eye on those, and of course piracy as well. Uh, we've seen what an impact that has on the, on the world's trade. And this, this really sums it up to me. This was on the front of the Wall Street Journal uh, about two years ago. So a uh, very famous oil company had a tanker full of oil, and it was uh, scheduled, or it was, it was the, the manifest said it was going to go to the Amman, the UAE, and to Saudi. Well, for a couple of days, it actually popped over to Iran to do some other trading. Now, nothing illegal about that, but the fact that it was being kept secret, and this is an absolutely bona fide uh, you know, approach that they were taking, but if, if, if good companies can hide at sea, then just think about what, uh, what other organisations uh, could do. So, again, being able to monitor vessels and to see where they've been is, is a key capability now for a whole, reason of, well, a whole range of security applications, as we've just seen. So there are various ways of, of monitoring vessels uh, globally. Uh, you know, coastal systems, that they, that they're all over the globe, but of course they have a short range. So coastal radar, coastal AIS, probably go out to 30 or 40 miles. Uh, long range identification and tracking, the, the IMO standard system, again, tracks a certain number of vessels, probably at 25, 30,000. Uh, but again, it, it's a very complex system. Uh, it's active, the ship has to transmit. And, uh, and, it, and it's pretty costly. 
Uh, there's local systems, vessel monitoring systems that fisheries organisations or, or fisheries departments tend to have just to monitor fishing vessels. Again, very local and an active system where the ship actually has to uh, make a phone call or, or make contact via Inmas at Iridium or something. Uh, and then the satellite imagery, uh, again, just looking down uh, with pictures. Again, they can only cover very small areas. And again, all you see is a blob or, or a vessel. You've got no ID or attributes. You don't know what that vessel is. And then the satellite AIS, which is, is the core of my talk today. That gives you a complete global view of every vessel broadcasting AIS. And there's probably between 80 to 100,000 vessels out there broadcasting. Uh, and the, it's a passive surveillance. So the satellites are just monitoring that signal and picking it up. The ship doesn't have to do anything. So that really is the first truly global uh, vessel monitoring system that is, uh, that is out there. And this gives you a, an idea of, of what can happen. So when we talk about global AIS, th this slide just shows the coastal systems. So these are the short range systems that are monitoring traffic around ports. Now as I bring the next slide on, suddenly you can see a major difference. So we can see here the shipping lanes uh, up around Iceland, we can see all the fisheries, so uh, all the fishing vessels, so we can get a good, good view of this from, from where fishing is taking place. Uh, and again, it gives you the complete link of how goods are transported, uh, goods, whether legally or illegally, are transported between, between different countries. So a complete overview of what's happening in the deep oceans. And that's really what we'll talk about today. Now what it does, it uses a system called AIS. Now I don't intend to go into the technical details of this, but essentially uh, in, in two or three slides, AIS uh, was a system that was put together for safety of life at sea. It's an IMO mandated system. Every vessel over 300 gross tons has to have an AIS transponder on. And it essentially was designed for a very short range, either ship to ship or ship to shore. And it says who the ship is, where it is, what speed it's going, its course, etc. I'll show you later the, uh, the information that comes from it. Uh, the key thing is that it wasn't designed to be picked up in space. So we actually proved that we could do that. Uh, the issue being that, that AIS was meant to work within a 40 mile cell or radius of a cell. Uh, whereas the satellite sees 3,000 miles. So there's a lot of information being broadcast, a lot of interference, collisions, uh, the radio spectrum is, 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 is very complex. Uh, and so what happens is that uh, we can bring the data down to the, the ground, process it, and, and, and really capture all those vessels. So that the ground-based processing, that the, the, the ability to sift through the noise is, is critical. And it also gives us a number of other advantages, which you'll see later on, about uh, ship location identification. And this is really an indication of, of, of what uh, bringing the, the spectrum down to the ground does. On the left, we can see a, a normal satellite picking up the vessel messages. That it picked up about 400 over about 10 minutes. That's the, the time the satellite is in view. Uh, when we do the advanced ground-based processing, we get five times as many, 2,000 vessels in one orbit. So the quicker you get the data, the quicker you get the full picture, that's really what make the difference, or makes the difference to the applications that you'll see later on in the presentation. So the information that we actually get from the, the ship is, uh, is this. It's, it's very rich, it's, it's highly attributed. It's the ship identification, it's the location, uh, the course, the speed. Uh, again, the ship can enter estimated time of arrival, etc. So a lot of information that can be used for some, some processing, and as we'll see later on, uh, for doing some preventative type analysis, looking at ships that potentially are in trouble uh, and so aiding in, in search and rescue and things. So very rich data set directly down from the, uh, from the satellite. However, there's been a lot of, of, of talk recently in the press about you know, accessibility and, and, and you know, is, should this data be made open? Well, uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the publicly available satellite AIS data, you know, th there are security implications. We have to be aware of that. And so commercial satellite vendors operate under a government license. Uh, we operate under the, uh, the Canadian government license at the moment and, and, and part of that license states that this data will not be sold or made available to anybody who's obviously on the UN denied parties list or is, uh, is, is on a, 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 a blacklist from, from various governments and also anybody who put a vessel at risk. So any, any organisation that, that may interfere with shipping that could put a vessel at risk, they, they will not be allowed access. And again, lots of discussion going on. We're heavily involved in that with major coast guards around the world, with the IMO, to make sure that this data is, is properly controlled. 
We heard this morning about the new standards for hydrographic charting and, and one of the things, the S100, uh, the chart that's replacing the S57 chart, uh, this now does allow for temporal data. So we're going to be doing a lot more work with the various uh, hydrographic bodies to see how AIS data can be incorporated into the, the, the standard ENC type approach. Uh, very important, the, the, the satellite AIS data is, is new data to a lot of people, so the ability to integrate it into their work processes is, is key, and I think S100 will be a, a key part of that. But as we said, we, we've talked a lot about S100 at the show already. So the rest of my presentation is really going to focus on, on applications because again, you know, just, just being able to, to see the vessels is one thing, to be able to use that information to, to make decisions, to, to, cause, to, to create alerts and to help in, in general maritime operations such as search and rescue is key and, and that's really where the value of satellite AIS is, uh, is, uh, is, is obvious. So vessel traffic monitoring, again, keeping an eye on what's happening out there, security, surveillance, search and rescue, fisheries protection, you know, all these can really benefit from using satellite AIS. So we'll talk about a number of these applications over the next few slides. So from the security perspective, um, you've probably heard the phrase maritime domain awareness. Very, very straightforward. It's understanding what is happening out in the deep oceans. Uh, so it's understanding and being aware of, of, of the maritime domain. Uh, so what satellite AIS lets you do is, is understand what's called maritime normal. You know, what are the normal conditions? You saw on, on a previous slide about the, the major shipping lanes. You, you, can, you, know, you can infer various things from that. You, you get an understanding of what ships would normally do. If you understand normal conditions, you identify these trends. If you know the trends, anything that's different is an anomaly. So immediately you can actually say, hmm, something strange here. You can then do your queuing of, of other assets. So if you're, a, if you're a, a coast guard, you could send a maritime patrol aircraft out or a vessel, or you could, uh, it may just trigger something that says, I want to check on this ship. I want to see what cargo it's carrying and where it came from. So this whole process of understanding the normal conditions really helps us identify vessels of interest, suspicious vessels, threats, etc. And that really, it's a continual process. You have to monitor, you know, continually as the satellites are orbiting, and it's a global effort. Finding a suspicious vessel is one thing, knowing where it's been for the past six months is another. And, and together they really do help the identification process. So uh, one of our major customers, the Canadian government, they, they operate maritime security operation centres. This is a slide that they've kindly uh, provided to me to use. Uh, the, again, the, the, the usage of the data here it, it's, it's a very, very good view of what's called white shipping. You know, that the 90% the, the of vessels that are going about their normal business. You know, having the picture from satellite lets you actually, you know, remove 90% of vessels from your, from your inquiry area, shall we say. It lets you focus in on those, those suspicious vessels or the vessels of interest. And you can also track watch list vessels. Obviously, certain vessels are known to be... Uh, how should we say, you know, causing issues. So they can be tracked around the globe and, and, and ports and uh, authorities can be warned against their arrivals. But it enables you to get a very quick overview, a very comprehensive overview of the, of the maritime picture. Uh, and these next slides really do, you know, show how that was used. So again, back in 2010, the Vancouver Olympics, uh, you can see the size of the areas here that, that were needed to be covered. The only way of doing them was from satellite. Uh, you can identify vessels that maybe radar has picked up, uh, a ship's radar may have picked up a, a, another vessel a long way away using satellite AIS. You can find out who that vessel is, good guy, bad guy, or whatever. Um, and it lets you fill in the gaps. Again, you know, coastal radar reaches a certain distance, uh, other AIS systems, you know, the, the military vessels have AIS that, that allows them to pick things up, but again, satellite AIS gives you the whole picture. So it's very useful in terms of, of, of maritime domain awareness for the Olympics. So useful, in fact, that the, in South Africa, uh, for the World Cup, they did exactly the same. Uh, obviously, you know, South Africa is surrounded by, by oceans. Uh, and the key thing here was the amount of time it gave the authorities uh, to plan. So if you were relying on, on purely coastal systems, then you would have had two or three hours if you found a suspicious vessel in your waters. You know, 30 miles out, it could be close to land in two or three hours. Using satellites and the satellite AIS systems, uh, you had two to three days to plan. So again, it gives you more, more control over the situation and again, was a, a very successful deployment uh, for, the, uh, for the World Cup. 
The other thing as well is, is you know, ships can spoof their location. Uh, sounds a bit James Bondish, but you can get GPS jammers, you can set the GPS incorrectly. Um, and this was an example that we found where we, there were seven Chinese fishing vessels slap bang in the middle of India, as you see up there on the top left. Uh, somewhat suspicious, no rivers in the area, so what are they doing? Uh, well, one of our guys took a look at the data and just by changing uh, the longitude uh, to the correct longitude by changing a sign, they ended up 200 miles off the coast of Chile. Now that's where Chinese fishing vessels normally fish. 200 miles and maybe 30 yards. So. Uh, you know, we're not sure exactly what they were doing, but immediately the Chilean authorities were able to go and check that they were, you know, in, in, in the appropriate areas, they weren't illegal fishing, etc. Now, was that, was that a mistake? Maybe. You know, was it on purpose? Who knows? Illegal fishing, as we'll see later on, is, is a big issue. Uh, but essentially, that, we caught that manually. Now, that, that was a bit of good luck. So imagine if we could do that automatically. Well, that's what's going to be possible uh, by using the, the ground-based processing we spoke about before. We'll be able to identify whether a ship is actually sending a signal from, from, from the correct area. Again, using this advanced radio frequency processing, knowing where the satellite is, checking the radio frequency message. We'll be able to tell, is a ship in the, in the approximate area that it says it is? So immediately we'll be able to provide alerts, uh, as you saw before, you know, fishing vessels that say they're in one area but are actually in a, an exclusive economic zone, illegal fishing, you know, that, that's very important. So this will be one of the key services that will become available through Satellite AIS in the future. Now we mentioned earlier on about the different uh, capabilities that, that were available to, to monitor the oceans. One of them was, was satellite imagery. Now there's a lot of interest now in, in integrating Satellite AIS with satellite imagery because imagery itself says there's something there but it doesn't identify what is there. So to be able to see all the vessels in an area and then use AIS to identify the cooperating vessels, i.e. those that are broadcasting, immediately leaves the ones that aren't broadcasting as the uncooperative vessels. And again, you've, you've suddenly found vessels of interest. Why aren't they broadcasting if they're a certain size? So we've done a lot of work on this. This is some work off Indonesia where the, the grey area there is, is the radar image. The, the red dots are essentially vessels that the radar image has picked up. And I'll, I'll show you what it looks like later on. The, the green areas there are AIS vessels or vessels that were broadcasting AIS that we've identified and, 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 and tied down to those other vessels. Uh, the area just uh, slightly north of the blue area there were uh, small wooden fishing vessels as it turns out. They wouldn't have AIS on so the guys uh, down at the bottom of the, of the grey area uh, weren't important. It's the four to the upper right coordinates or the, the upper right corner there that are the guys of interest. And as it turns out, the Indonesian government did actually use this technique to identify some illegal movement of goods. So again, very useful in terms of being able to identify. That, that's what the radar image essentially gives you. So, you know, is it a ship? Is it a, a container that's happened to have fallen overboard and is reflecting? Is it a huge, you know, tree trunk or something? You know, the radar image says something that says something is there. AIS can identify that. And here, as you see, we've done some processing to, to say these are the ship tracks that take us closest. These are what we believe the, the cooperative vessels to, uh, to be. Um, and again, that can be used not only for identifying suspicious vessels, but also looking at the environment. This is a, a, a very large radar uh, mosaic, in effect, down between South Africa and, and, uh, and, and Madagascar there. Uh, when we zoom into it, we can see in the middle of the image uh, is a, is a blue line, uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this in the audience, but there's a blue line here which is an oil slick. Uh, at the end of that blue line is a ship, so immediately we know, or we can 99% safely say that ship is the, the cause of that, to that pollution. So again, you can check on the oil on the ship, you can get samples of the oil in the ocean and, and, uh, and essentially find out who is, the, uh, who is the polluter. So radar imagery is used widely for identifying uh, you know, oil and, and, and pollution on the surface of the ocean. Okay, let's move on to, to vessel monitoring now. Um, I mentioned before about using the information in the AIS message to, to, be, to, to do preventative uh, search and rescue. Uh, and, and here's an example. So this, this is a vessel, uh, as we see, it was uh, progressing down. This is Canada uh, or Nova Scotia. The vessel seems to be proceeding down quite happily. But if we, if we focus in on this central area, then we can see that the ship did some very strange maneuvers. Now, if you put that in front of a maritime expert, uh, what he'd say is that looks like the ship had, had severe problems, you know, the, the engine failure or whatever and was drifting. 
Now, the satellite information that we have for this, the AAS information, shows that you know, between different collects, it went from 13 knots down to 0.3, so obviously slowed down enormously. More importantly, the course over ground and the heading started to differ widely. Now, what that means is that if a ship is, is not under power, it will tend to go with the current, and it will tend to go sideways on. So the course will be going sideways uh, with, the, with the currents. The heading, where the ship is pointing, will be you know, around 90 degrees opposite from that, probably, uh, because that's where the ship is pointing, as opposed to moving. So immediately we can say this vessel looked as though it was drifting. So if we can apply that automatically as the information comes in, you'll be able to see vessels that, that, that are potentially in trouble. And, and the next few slides show a real-world application of this. So this is all the vessels going around uh, South Africa, Cape Town there at the bottom, uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Lots and lots of information. If we apply that uh, processing that we saw before, looking at the course over ground and the heading, uh, we can immediately say from all those hundreds and well, thousands of ships, we end up with seven where the course over ground and the heading are different. So immediately, you know, the guy's way away from land, probably no problem. The guy's close to land, you know, if that's, a, if that's a large oil tanker drifting within 100 miles of your very sensitive coastline, I think you'd want to know about that. So this immediately allows the, the Coast Guard, the Maritime Safety Agency, to pick the phone up, call that ship, and find out what's going on. You know, a lot of ships will not dial in immediately if they've got problems, they'll try and fix it themselves, etc. This enables the Coast Guards to really keep an eye on, on what is going on out there. So that, that's a key use of, of satellite AIS. Um, We've all read the press. Um, I'm sure we've all booked our cruises for our holidays this year. Um, but this is the Costa Allegra. This is the, the sister ship of the Concordia. This is the one that had the problems out near the Seychelles. Uh, this is the fishing vessel that, uh, that helped tow her in, probably the, the biggest catch the fishing, fishing vessel's ever made, I, I suspect. Um, anyway, when we look back at what the AAS signals uh, were saying is that they were fine here, 15 knots, pretty typical speed for a cruise, course over ground and heading very similar. Suddenly, course changes, and then we lose the heading information. Now, the Allegra had a fire on board. The heading comes from the ship systems. They obviously went off. So immediately, that, that, that flags a problem. Now, I'm pretty sure that these guys called in pretty quickly with being a passenger vessel. But again, it shows you that you can automatically identify a potential issue with a ship purely from the, the satellite AIS information. Okay, we, we mentioned before about uh, environmental monitoring. Ships produce 4% of CO2. They also produce sulfur and, and nitrous oxide or oxides of nitrogen. So, you know, really are pumping things out into the atmosphere. So, if we know the ship, we know the type of engine it's got, we know the speed it's doing, we can start, you know, working out where that, uh, that pollution occurs. And this is some work that's been done by the Finnish Meteorological Institute uh, using some satellite AIS data showing where obviously you have the, the largest pollution. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can see here the Straits of Malacca and up here you know, by Japan. And it's a very complex model that takes in the position, the speed, it takes in the engine power, friction resistant fuel type and, and models all that. But again, only by understanding this can we improve upon it. Okay, in, in terms of planning, uh, putting new ports in, understanding where you have to have search and rescue capabilities, <coughs> excuse me, it's important to see what the uh, typical traffic patterns are. So here we go. This is a, uh, basically a view of four months within the Arctic. So if we start looking here, this is in June, very few ships around. We can start seeing as the as the ice recedes, more and more vessels start appearing. Not sure if you'll be able to, to see that at the, uh, at the back, but uh, essentially we can see over the four months of summer, lots and lots of activity, things being transported. As we get close to September and October, the ice starts coming back in again. We're not actually showing that. This is just beautiful on Google Earth. And suddenly the ships have disappeared by the end of October. Only a couple of icebreakers probably going around. So, by looking at that and creating heat patterns, so here we can see this is the densest area. You know, Coast Guards can plan ahead. They can understand you know, what the typical traffic patterns are. So again, very important for, for planning and preventative, what I call preventative search and rescue. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund are also using this to really see the impact of shipping upon animals. 
uh, the, the fauna in, 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 in remote areas. So again, it has a, another environmental use as, uh, as well. Okay, we, we, we're coming back to the safety issue again because you know, AIS was initially developed as a, as a safety system. Uh, again, just using South Africa as an example, uh, in certain weather conditions, we, you know, there can be rogue waves, you know, very, very treacherous uh, navigation conditions. And again, depending on the ship, whether it's low draft, uh, whether it's, it's, it's fully loaded, uh, the speed it's going, the route it's going, is it going you know, perpendicular to the, the route of the current? All these things you know, really have an effect. And so again, we can put things like wave information. This comes from NOAA, three hour updates, uh, near real time information on, on wind speed and wave heights and etc. Tie that in with the satellite information, the AAS information, and from that, you can pick out maybe three ships that could be at risk of, of foundering. Uh, that might be for a number of reasons. Again, draft being a key one type of ship. Is it loaded up and, and the direction speed it's going? So the Coast Guard, again, could call these guys up and say, we think you're going too fast for the conditions, either slow down or pull into port or head back or whatever. So again, preventative, you know, uh, search, and well, search and rescue, Coast Guard applications, improving the safety of vessels out at, uh, out at sea. The information from the AIS, the location, can again also be used for verification. Uh, this was an example where a, a vessel uh, exchanged its ballast water. It said it exchanged it out here. This is its logbook positions. So it went away from the coast and ballast water, as you know, is taken on all around the world. You don't want to change ballast water from Australia close to uh, another, close to say, you know, the coast of another country. You might introduce uh, different animals, you might introduce some, some source of, uh, of infection or, or whatever. So you can only change your ballast water in certain areas, you know, out here. The ship was under suspicion, so the, uh, the authorities looked at the satellite AIS location and proved that the guy never actually went outside the zone. Uh, he was shown this, the skipper, immediately guilty and was, uh, was subject to a very severe fine. So again, using satellite AIS to verify what people are saying they're doing, especially when it's, it's, it's a critical thing like changing ballast water or, or cleaning tanks or changing engine parts or whatever. You can use it for, for immediate verification. And I don't know if, if a number of you remember about 18 months ago, there was a, uh, an environmental in incident uh, down on the Great Barrier Reef. There was a, a Chinese coal carrier uh, was going through a valid route down here on the Great Barrier Reef, but unfortunately misjudged it. Uh, hit the, the reef, caused immense damage, and obviously was, uh, was polluting through oil. Now, as you can see here, this is the gap. It's, it's a valid ship route or sea route. Uh, these are two AIS receivers that the Australians have put on there now to check vessels in the area. But as you can see, they make the decision to go down that route about 24 hours beforehand. Uh, and again, we can see here, this is an example of some vessels heading down to the reef. You can see the route they've taken and where they made the decision to, uh, to change route. Uh, so this means the Coast Guards or the Maritime Safety Agency can actually see who's heading for that gap. They know the vessel. You know, is it, is it a bona fide skipper? Does he know what he's doing? So again, they can really check on guys heading for, for what is it, you know, quite a difficult navigational uh, route down here. So again, forewarned is, is forearmed, as they say. This is, this is advanced information that helps you manage your, uh, your vessels better. Um, we talked a lot about vessel safety. This, this is more getting on to some of the security uh, aspects now. Uh, so we've worked with a company called i2 who do link analysis software. So they, they, they link different things together within the software. And this is an example where in just taking a day's worth of data of vessels in the, in the Horn of Africa, they have, have, have applied it to, to their software and they, they've com compared the data or, or, or uh, you know, data mined information in, in what's called the World Check database. Now, that's a commercial offering, but it's, it's the database that banks use to check on organizations. Uh, you know, if you're transferring money between accounts, you know, large sums of money, World Check will be used to make sure it's not being laundered and, and people are bona fide. Well, they ran the, the, the vessel information against this database and came up with one vessel that was suspect. And the reason it was suspect was it was owned by an organization, the Islamic Republic of Iran Shipping Lines. When you drill down, it shows up that that's a sanctioned entity. So what you could then do is to say, okay, let's look at all the other vessels owned by this company. Where are they going? And if they're all going between Iran and Somalia, you know, it gives an indication that there's something untoward going on. So, again, it just shows the value of integrating this, 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 the, the satellite AIS information 
with other database information. Uh, the synergy of, of integrating information gives you far greater results. Uh, and again, you can you know, use this for a whole range of different applications, not just intelligence applications. The VOI, by the way, is vessels of interest. Anti-piracy, uh, again, a common theme of, of many of the conferences nowadays, and obviously, you know, the front page of the news quite a lot. Um, quite a, a few agencies, NATO, UNAV4, uh, various navies around the world are using satellite AIS to get an understanding of the conditions out there. Obviously, you know, the pirates, normally you can't track unless they're using a mothership, as you'll see in the next slides. Uh, but having satellite AIS over the areas of interest uh, really do help you, you know, identify uncharacteristic behaviour. You know, is a ship changing direction frequently? Is it zigzagging? Is it hunting for prey, shall we say? Uh, you can integrate it with other geospatial information to identify when attacks are likely to occur based on weather conditions. And again, you can look at the history just to see if, if a vessel has acted suspiciously. Uh, and again, you can immediately then start tracking it to see, uh, to see what is happening. So this is something just from January 2012, uh, again working with the, the Office of Naval Intelligence here. So uh, this vessel was in port in Mogadishu, a uh, pirated vessel, still broadcasting AIS, 30th of December. Um, it then left port and went down to uh, another port in Somalia for seven days, not sure really what it was doing there. But then it left the coast and, and, and slowly moved up to the, this is at the pirate anchorage area, this is a well-known area for for them sort of storing pirated vessels, there's, there's one up there uh, already. Uh, so, you know, just tracking that, keeping an eye on what's going on. At the same time, uh, another pirated vessel uh, made a move. It hadn't moved for, for quite some time. Uh, it had been there for several months, and then suddenly it moved. But it, we then didn't pick it up for three or four days. Probably turned its AIS off, didn't want to be seen. But then, three days later, it starts transmitting again. Now, the AS transponder will both transmit and receive, so perhaps he was out in the shipping lanes there looking at other vessels around him. In other words, was he acting as a mothership trying to find uh, vessels that, that were possible hijack uh, targets? Uh, again, this is work that we were doing with ONI. This is the, one of the, the reports. Uh, obviously, uh, the organisations uh, transmit these reports to ships in the area as, as warnings. Uh, and again, we can see there that this was the liquid velvet and the uh, Nawal Ali uh, together, very suspicious activity as we saw from, from tracking using the satellite AIS. So again, very useful in the, the war against piracy. Uh, fisheries protection, I, I mentioned earlier on that, that uh, illegal fishing is an issue. It's in fact a $30 billion a year industry, if you want to call it that. Uh, it it you know, plays havoc with, with you know, countries' economies. The, one of the reasons we have the issue in Somalia is that most of the pirates are fishermen whose fishing grounds have been depleted through illegal fishing. So, you know, we, we have to take account of this. It's, it's not just a, a fisheries issue, it's a security issue as well. So this is just an example. Uh, the US Coast Guard, uh, obviously looking after their exclusive economic zone, this is Hawaii. Uh, there was a fishing vessel sat in port for a while, 22nd of February, it left the port. It then went quiet for three days, in other words, no AAS transmissions from it. The next day, 26th of Feb, and then onwards, it started transmitting, and it was going full steam ahead back to its home port. So immediately the Coast Guard could say, right, you know, this guy, 99% certain he's been illegal fishing. Nothing they could do about it then, but the fact he turned it off and then turned it back on again three days later, going for his home port, identified him as possibly illegal fishing. So now, now he is a watched vessel. When he comes back into the area, an alarm, an alarm will go off and the Coast Guard will use its other assets, its fisheries protection vessels, its maritime patrol aircraft to keep an eye on him. So he's now a marked man. So, you know, people say that this is a passive system. It only, only picks up when ships broadcast AIS. Well, yes, but the fact they turn it off sometimes is an indicator to us as well. It's, it's almost like, think of it as camouflage. They, they think they're camouflage, but when they pop back up again, we can see them and infer what's gone on in between. So... Again, just an example of, of, of how we can monitor fishing as well and also you know, use the, uh, the, the AS signal to identify you know, vessels of interest. And the final area, um, again, you know, the, there are incidents at sea. You know, there will inevitably be incidents at sea for a long time. Uh, understanding what's happened in them will help prevent other similar incidents. So we can use the AS data for post-event analysis. Um, 
This was an example uh, of a, a cruise ship going down, very popular coming down here, the, the Magellan Straits, uh, Drake's Passage, uh, down off the, 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 the tip of South America. Uh, so this was a, a cruise ship that, that, that got into trouble. And when we look at the, the AIS signal, we can see it came down here all the way around, was doing all very nicely until it got to here. Now on the 7th of December, it reported engine failure. We, we can see it, it slowed down enormously, hence the, the engine failure. However, in the post-event analysis, what, 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 what could be gathered or garnered from it is what happened here. There's something happened here. Did the skipper not report engine failure there? Did he have other issues? So again, the, the, the analysts at the end can look at this and, and, and start you know, working out what really happened. If, if he did have engine failure, he could have put his passengers at risk. So again, it's important to know what has happened. And this, this track, this monitoring, really does help people understand the conditions. And again, you know, lead the, that will lead to changes in procedures and processes which will improve things. Okay, so really I, I've hoped there to give you a good overview of, of satellite AIS and, and, and what it can be used for. Uses are growing daily. Every time we speak to, to somebody new, they, they have a new application for it. And hopefully you've got a feel for, for really the value it brings, both in preventative applications and in, 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 in uh, verification, validation and things. Uh, AIS has been very successful, it's here to stay, it's on, it's on up to 100,000 vessels, no one knows the, the, the real number. Uh, it's fully operational, there's customers around the world using it, you know, most of those examples we saw were actual customer examples. Uh, it's the only system that really gives true deep sea coverage in all sea states, so we can monitor vessels globally. And, as the title of my presentation said, it, uh, you know, satellite AIS does complete you know, the picture with a global view of maritime traffic. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions uh, now. Thank you.